for more. Let's go to Khartoum and uh, Holud Hayer. She's managing uh, partner at Inside Strategy Partners. Thank you for speaking with us here on France 24. Thanks, Antoine. How are things in the neighborhood where you are? There's been some pretty heavy bombardment um, recently, as, as 10 minutes ago. Um, and we've heard also sort of anti-aircraft uh, return of fire uh, from the paramilitary forces. Um, so this looks like it's a, it's a conflict that's not only not going anywhere, but it's, it's escalating too. We're also hearing of um, new regiments from South being deployed on this, as well as RSF, um, you know, troops coming in from the West. So it looks like we may have to uh, settle in for the long haul. Troops coming in from the West, uh, it, it, does it sound like a lot of the, can we infer from that that uh, a lot of the means are being poured into the capital? Yes, yeah, so this war, this conflict is going on in multiple on in multiple sites across the country. The cartoon is both the symbolic and the geographic prize of both the Sudan Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces. And so this is really where it, you know, it makes sense in many ways for Burhan and Hineti, who cultivated and grew their um, military careers effectively in Darfur, um, to uh, on one side to now come and fight each other for the capital. Um, Darfur, we know over the past 20 years, and we have to remember the Darfur conflict hasn't finished, um, has been a place that has um, had imported and then transported a lot of the, the conflict dynamics we see today. Uh, just a question about the, the, the when there have been lulls, have you been able to get, get outside yourself? I was, uh, I, I live near the, the airport, which is the epicenter of the fighting. Uh, somewhere between the airport and the adjacent army headquarters is where the, the majority of the fighting has been concentrated and where the majority of the bombardment has been concentrated. Um, and of course, sensing that it was too dangerous to stay there, we made a run for it um, a few days ago and have since come to a different part of town, which is marginally safer. Um, but we are actually quite lucky because a lot of people cannot move from where they are. The advice has been from both the international community and the armed forces and the paramilitary forces to stay indoors while they, while they fight this out. Um, but for some people that's not possible. Um, but also movement is not possible. So it's a very difficult choice to stay or to go. And it looks like this could go on for a while uh, yet. Uh, we're uh, hearing efforts again to try to... Uh, to garner something that resembles a, 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 a truce, uh, it seems as though neither side wants one. Well, neither side is invested in one right now. There is no incentive either that can be dangled in front of them to get them to a negotiating table. Both sides are in this um, to the bitter end. And until such point where they either feel that like they're losing or um, or that a victory for either of them is not possible, we won't see any voluntary de-escalation. What is required now is for the international community, particularly those who have um, not just influence, but leverage over the security sector in Sudan, over both generals to get involved. Those are specifically the Arab countries in the neighborhood, from the Gulf to North Africa. Yeah, and if we look at who's got leverage, uh, we saw last Saturday, and we saw in that report there, uh, talking about the, the heavy fighting that's been taking place around the strategic town of, uh, of Meroe, uh, that's b uh, along the Nile north between Khartoum and the Egyptian border. Um, the uh, RSF says that uh, a group of captured Egyptian soldiers has been transferred to Khartoum, and they want to do a handover when it's safe. How does... What's Egypt's role in all of this, and how do they play it? Well, unlike many sort of security actors in the region and further afield, I'm thinking here of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Israel, and Russia, who have relationships with both generals, um, Egypt is unequivocally on the side of Burhan. And so the fact that it has, you know, Egyptian troops that are in the hands of his enemy, I assume, would not sit very well with Cairo. And this increases the the likelihood of Cairo getting involved ostensibly to rescue its, its troops, but also to support its clients or its partner in Sudan, General Burhan. So this could have a very immediate regional repercussion and potentially draw in other actors on the other side. 
And when it comes to who's got leverage uh, in terms of brokering a, a ceasefire that can hold, uh, where are your hopes turning? Um, frankly, there's not much hope to be found anywhere. Uh, certainly Egypt, I don't think, has any, um, even though it has leverage over Burhan, it will have very leverage, little leverage on Himeti. So mediation for Egypt is out. But potentially it could curb the extent to which it supports uh, General Burhan, both aerially and in terms of, of giving supplies. On the other side, we have the UAE, um, who is a big sponsor of General Himeti. And if they can be persuaded to not fuel this conflict by giving him supplies, of which he's sure to run out pretty soon, then potentially we can see a, a point where they both won't be able to continue the fight anymore and actually feed um, to a civilian um, or humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, Halud Hayir, one final question for you. Uh, the, uh uh, it's nighttime, uh, nightfall rather, uh, it, it, where you are right now. It's the it's the month of Ramadan, so it's the time when people break the fast. Uh, Thursday or Friday, it's going to be uh, the Eid, the end of the Ramadan. Normally, uh, a period of feasting that all Muslims look forward to. Is this completely irrelevant to the parties that are fighting? It won't make a difference. There's a very strong chance that it won't make a difference. I mean, anybody who starts a fight of this scale in, in highly populated areas uh, during the fasting month and the most po holy part of the fasting month, the final 10 days, is clearly a godless person. And so I don't think that, you know, the Eid argument or the religious argument is necessarily going to win, and win them over. However, I do think that the Arab countries in the region and Muslim countries in the region, um, bilaterally as well as through the Muslim councils that exist, can put pressure on them um, and join everybody else in putting pressure on them to at least give a reprieve and a ceasefire over the Eid holiday so that people may take some respite. Halud Hayir, many thanks for joining us live from Hartoum. We wish you the best.